Hello, it's James from xrobots.co.uk. It's part four of Project Ultron. The aim is to build a life-size Ultron torso at least, possibly do some research into legs, and build Ultron as a real robot. And the robot's going to partially be controlled by motion capture, so I've built this motion capture suit using inertial measurement units, which uh, attach to my legs, my body, my head, and two on my arm, and only my left arm. And the aim is that basically using those inertial measurement units, we can control a right arm, which doesn't have any sensors on the human, to actually control the right side of Ultron. So it's a bit like a naturally moving prosthetic body. There's going to be some AI in the middle as well, which takes sensors, so it's going to be quite a social robot, which can use vision, sound, and other sensors to work out what to do. So it may not do what the wearer expects, because it's going to make its own decisions as well. Last time I built this little robot arm to do some testing, so a lot of this project to start with is going to be R&D into robotics. I built this little robot arm and I controlled it from one sensor of my motion capture suit, which is on the upper arm or my left arm, to try and make it mirror that sensor. And that worked out quite well, and most of the video was trying to um, get my head around Euler angles, as I've found it's pronounced, even though it's written Euler angles to uh, try and work out what the data is that comes out of those sensors. And they do some maths on board and just give you the Euler angle. But I was quite confused when I was first looked at it. So have a look at last part, part three, and part one for the full explanation and to see this uh, arm and that piece of development in process. So uh, obviously this arm's really small. This was only a test. The real Ultron is going to be probably 20% bigger than human. But I have to do the R&D first, so build a small arm and test it with a sensor before I go on to build the life-size one because I don't really want to make too many mistakes and have to go back and do it all again like I did with Hulkbuster's hands. So let's see what we're going to discuss this time. It's another bit of R&D. I'm going to be looking at series elastic actuators. Here's the robot arm I built last time and this is currently powered on. It's stationary because the mannequin is just stood still over the other side and has the inertial measurement unit on its left arm which is stationary. Um, if I go and grab one of these joints and try and move it, it's quite hard to move because the servo is trying to stay on this position. I can move it, but then it springs back and that's the same for all of them. And uh, basically the servos try and get to this position and stay there. They've got a holding torque. So if I let go of one, it'll spring back. Um, if I power this down, of course, I can move all of these you know, pretty easily. As soon as I power it up again, they all go back to their target position. Um, the plan is to build this as a, a robot humanoid arm, 20% bigger than a person. That could be quite dangerous, because if you can imagine this thing swinging around um, with all the force that will be required and only much bigger motors, it could be quite dangerous if it hits someone. However, if I'm a human and I'm moving around and I knock into something, then I can sense that that's happened. Um, and I can decide that there's force being exerted on my arm and I can stop pushing. Also, if someone goes and grabs my arm and moves it, they'll probably be able to move my arm, unless I'm expecting it, and then I try and resist like I'm doing an arm wrestle. So what I'd like to do is be able to build that into Ultron so it's quite socially interactive. You can go and grab it and move its arms around, unless it doesn't want you to, or it can tell how much force is being exerted onto its joints whilst it's in motion or whilst it's not in motion. Radio control servos aren't really going to cut it for this demo, so I'm going to build a bigger motorised robotic joint to do the testing with. So I'm going to 3D print basically a linear actuator with a screw and a sort of nut that rides up and down it. And I've just taken these out of the Autodesk 123D gear or hardware library and modified them slightly. So it was a nut and a bolt. Now I've got this sort of linear shaft and I've um, drawn this part on the top to couple to the motor. So I'll put a captive nut in that's going to be driven by a DC motor. And I've put pivot points on the sides of the nut there. So obviously when the um, screw turns, the nut will go up and down and that's going to go across my joint to say make an L or something like that. Now this can't be back driven very easily because it's like trying to force a nut down a, down a bolt. Obviously it doesn't really work unless you turn them. So this is really good for the demo to show that we're not just pushing the motor backwards, we're actually going to use sensing to make it drive backwards when a force is applied to it. So we'll get those printed and see how well that works and then build up the rest of the joint. So here's my finished screw thread, so this works quite well. If I screw this up it goes through, obviously no matter how much pressure I push on there I can't push it through without turning it. 
So this is going to actuate the joint and obviously I won't be able to back drive that at all. It's completely mechanically stiff apart from when this is turned. I've got pivot points there and on the other end of course goes this motor. Now I put this uh, hole in the end here so I can put a nut into that slot and put a bolt through and that should grip the flat of the motor shaft. For now I can plug these together and we can test driving it. So if I put some power on the motor, see we, that's the wrong way. And you can see uh, how that's going to work. And it's got quite a lot of torque in it. Obviously I need to put that nut in and then we need to control it. It seems to work pretty well, which is quite good for a 3D print. I'm quite happy with that. So let's look at the rest of the arm design. The next part of this, of course, is to give it an arm to actuate. So we've got um, a, several parts. So we've got a green part that's a clamp, which can be screwed to the edge of a table or something like that. And that's going to hold the whole thing. The blue thing is the main arm, and of course the motor mounts on the red part there with those four screws. And uh, the screw thread will then face down to the arm, so as the screw thread moves and the nut moves up and down, it will cause the blue part to rotate. So um, that would be all very well and good and if we had um, a hinge point on the blue arm for the other end where the nut is then of course that would be nice and rigid and it would move up and down and it will work very well. But what we need to do is actually sense uh, any force or any load uh, back driving it or in either direction on that actual joint. So we've got this sort of scoop cut out at the moment uh, on, it, on this blue part in the middle which is going to allow the coupling to slide up and down. It needs a top on it so that's going to look more like a slot than just a recess but obviously I need to um, actually attach that nut to it so that thing's going to slide up and down and it's going to be um, fixed in there with some sort of elastic thing that I'll probably print in NinjaFlex so it's slightly flexible and then when we back drive the joint we'll be able to measure how much it moves in that slot and that's going to give us our feedback. Here are some of the parts printed, so I've got my motor mounted with the linear actuator on a pivot and of course the arm here is on another pivot at the bottom, so um, if this nut is just coupled directly to the arm as it moves up and down of course that would cause the arm to move, that's a fairly basic actuator. What I'm going to do is have the coupling have an ability to move very slightly and that's going to be attached to something elastic and it's in series with the output actuator and that's why it's called a series elastic actuator. So I've got one sensor here which is a potentiometer that's going to measure the main angle of the arm and another one which is a slide pot which can slide up and down and that can measure how much pressure is being applied to the elastic thing and therefore it can work out what pressure we're applying at the end point or if someone grabs it and pushes it and we can work out what that force is and we can move the motor accordingly so instead of actually pushing the motor and pushing it backwards which is impossible with this type of actuator it's actually going to intelligently read this sensor and then move the position of the motor through the control electronics encoding. So I've put everything together I've now got this slider here which slides up and down and it's restrained with elastic bands so um, I was going to print something in NinjaFlex and if I was making this much bigger like a big industrial robot or the life-size Ultron I probably have NinjaFlex parts big blocks printed either side in a low density infill so they crush. Um, at the moment of course this will move so it's compliant and this slides up and down. I don't know if you can just see that. If I move it this way, you can see the gap gets bigger between my thumb and the white thing. And obviously the other way it moves that way. But it's still stiff enough that the actuator works. So if I just power the motor up, you can see the whole joint moving there. So that works fine. But obviously if it runs into something, then it will cause this to move. And I can measure that distance with this slide pot, which I need to mount. And combined with the position feedback, we can get quite a lot of control. So we can either stop it running into things when it hits something and it senses some motion here. Or as I say before, when it's back driven and this moves, we can compensate by moving the motor so we can make it compliant and quite interactive. I've just mounted the potentiometer on here, this slide pot with a bit of sticky tape. So I'm going to make a lever to attach that to the slider. 
On the other side we're going to mount the pot for the angle. So I've got one of these again, this is straight out of last week's Hulkbuster video. So I've got a potentiometer there, a thing to attach to the joint and a thing to fit underneath. So this thing here will fit to the white part right underneath. And the uh, piece here will be solvent welded onto the black piece so it turns as the arm turns. I've now added some electronics to the arm, so around the back here we've got an Arduino Uno and an L298 motor controller module which can drive the motor through PWM to um, control the speed of it and the direction. So if we add all of those uh, potentiometers in, the slide pot's here, I've got two knobs mounted on a plate here, only one of them does something at the moment, and the potentiometer that measures the angle. And I've got some code running on the Arduino, reading all of those analog ins, and deciding what to do. So now if I turn this knob, which is the demand position, it will move the arm and try and match the actual position with this one until it achieves the position, then it'll stop. So I've essentially built um, a servo and this demand position could be from um, uh, any code from the AI or it could be from the motion capture suit driving the joint position. So it's a bit like a radio control servo, but I've built the whole thing out of an Arduino motors and pots. So what I'm using to control this is called a PID controller, which stands for proportional, integral and derivative. Um, there's quite a lot to read on that. It's the one that I used in my balancing ball robot when I built BB-8 and in fact the second version of BB-8. Um, all you really need to know is the proportional part basically will try and drive the position. So uh, this will be the set point I'm trying to achieve. The input is coming from here and the output is driving the motor. And the proportional means if the gap is bigger between the two, the motor will go faster. And as it's smaller, as the gap closes, then the motor will run slower. So you can see if I go from one extreme to the other, it starts very fast and decelerates as it gets there, which works quite well. What I've currently got is the input being the demands driving through my PID controller to drive the motor. And currently the position of the motor is feeding back to the PID controller so it knows when to start and stop and which direction to run in. What I want to do, and the whole purpose of this video, was to use the extra force sensor on the end which is in series with the output of the motor. So that's my force sensor. And what I want to do is bring that right back to modify the demand position. So I'm going to bring that all the way here like so, but I'm also going to put a sensitivity control in there, which is what the other knob is for, so I can tune how much difference that makes. So I'm going to code that up, we'll have a look at the code, and then we'll see it working. Here's the Arduino code that's running on that Arduino Uno. First of all, I'm including the PID library, which is the same PID library I've used in other projects, as I said. I've declared my variables here, which are for the four potentiometers, so the demand, the actual position, sensitivity, and the force feedback. The rest of these variables are for the PID controller. Uh, the PID controller is declared there with those variables, and um, further down we can see that I've set this up in automatic mode with limits of minus 255 to positive 255 and a sample time of 10, which is how often the loop runs. I've also declared my output pins for controlling the motor and I've got this line here which is quite interesting which sets the PWM frequency for those pins to 32 kilohertz which means we can't hear the PWM buzzing because 32 kilohertz is above audible frequency. In the main loop we're reading those four analog inputs on A0 through A3 pins and I'm doing some scaling here um, to try and get those to the right order. So the sensitivity I've scaled down so it's only got a value of 0 or 1 to 5, I should say. Um, the demand position is obviously plus minus 70. The actual position I've gone down to 8 bit for 255. Um, the force is quite interesting. I've got an offset on the negative there. Um, so it's more negative than positive and that's because the pot doesn't centre quite in the middle and that's mainly down to the strength of my elastic bands. So now we come to the actual PID control which is rather easy in fact our set point is the demands position and in the first demo I just showed you it was just the demand position and nothing else but now I've decided to subtract the force um, so that gives the feedback and it's the force multiplied by the sensitivity so that sensitivity potentiometer will modify the amount of force to control the sensitivity our input is the actual position and these are all the variables that go into the PID loop um, which we then run by doing my PID compute 
and that gives us an output value to drive the motor. And as with uh, previous motor or wheel controlling projects like the BB-8s, we've got this code here which says if the value of the output is smaller than minus one, then write output 10 to that value and nine to zero. If it's bigger than one, then write nine to that value and 10 to zero. So basically if the value is smaller than minus one, the motor will turn one way. If it's bigger than one, it will turn the other way. So we have a very small dead spot. And what we've got here is the else statement saying if it's neither of those, so if it's between minus one and one, then switch them both off. Lastly, there's a delay of 10, which means the loop runs every 10 milliseconds, which is 100 times a second. It's not quite that because there are other things going on in the loop. I should really be using the uh, multitasking timers, recording the time and doing timestamps to be more accurate, but for our purposes, this is fine. Alright, so all of that code is uh, now on the arm. There's one thing I'll point out, which is that I've adjusted my elastic bands just here. So uh, what should happen is this should spring back into the position it started at. So the potentiometer here that measures that amount of slide should, should sort of recenter. So at the moment it doesn't, it stays where I put it. Um, and that's bad and good. So I'll demonstrate why that is. But what should happen in one of these is there's sort of a buffer either side of this that's strong enough to spring it back. So it only um, moves this pot when I apply pressure to it. So let's power this up and see what happens. Right, so I've got my sensitivity set right down to one, so it doesn't uh, make the sensitivity really big, but it's quite good for now. So if I turn the um, demand switch, then this works as it did before, so this moves the arm up and down. And that's all good. But now, if I actually push the arm, and I cause that pot to slide, then that force actually causes the motor to drive back. So it complies and goes where I want it to. Which works pretty well until I get to the end of that slide pot. And obviously if I turn the sensitivity up a bit, then it becomes far more sensitive. And if I push this really fast, or push it harder, it should go much faster. So we'll turn that down a little bit, which seems to work quite well there. So that seems to work quite well. The other thing is that if it crashes into something, so if I put my hand in the way and try and move it, then it should sense that something's there and the motor stops running. because it can get that feedback. So this works pretty well. Um, the only thing is that when the pot runs to the end, then it's got nowhere else to go. So um, at the moment, obviously, this is not springing back to the middle. It's staying where I put it, uh, which is bad because what should happen is when I let go, it should go back to the position it started at, of course, because this would spring back and then it would go back to the set point. As it is, it's quite good actually, because it means I can push it and it'll sort of go where I place it, and it'll almost stay there. In fact, if I'm quite rigid with it, I can just place it, and it'll stay there, and that works quite well. Um, that's bad for accuracy, of course, because the uh, robot arm isn't anywhere near where it wanted to move to, so if some, some code or the motion capture was running this control, and then I grabbed it and said, actually, no, I want you to go over here, then obviously this position isn't this position anymore. But that's actually not too bad because I'm always measuring the position of the arm so I can actually use this to work out where I am now and then adjust the uh, original input accordingly if I want to. And that can all be controlled with code whichever way I want to do it. This is of course just a test rig that I've built this week as it was last week. So I can do some testing on this and see if it's a good thing to build into Ultron when I build the full size one. Obviously, as I said at the beginning, I don't want to build things and have to go back and redo them too much. So you can imagine if this was built into the shoulder and the elbow of Ultron and it had that sort of feedback so it can sense when it's being pushed back or how much pressure is being applied, that could make it quite interactive. I want this to be a robot that isn't sat there with a do not touch sign on, I want people to be able to get hands on with it. So this is a great safety feature as well. But it could also adjust sensitivity based on how it's feeling, based on its AI. 
So they could turn the sensitivity right up for the feedback if it's feeling happy and playful and people can push it all around. And then when it's a bit bored of that, it can turn the sensitivity right down and push you back just the right amount. So I think I am going to build this into the joints and it's something I need to think about before I do them. I've got probably one more big piece of R&D to do in the next episode before I actually start building the real Ultron. Alright, so that's the end of this part. So don't forget to check out the previous ones, including part one, for a full explanation of what I'm trying to achieve. And don't forget to check out the other projects in my channel, including my BB-8 builds and Hulkbuster, of course.